انت الا بالله العلي العظيم حسبنا الله ونعم الوكيل لا علم الله ونعم النصير وبشهر صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل العقدة من لساني يفقه قلبي اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله قاصم الجبارين وبير الظالمين مدرك الحاربين والصلاة والسلام متحية والإكرام على النبي الأمي المكي المدني الهاشمي الذي اسمه في السماء بأحمد وفي الأرض بأبي القاصم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلي محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين ورحمة الله على مهبيهم ومواليهم وشيعتهم أجمعين ولعنة الدائم وعلى آدائهم وقتليهم وغاسب حقوقهم ومنكري فضائلهم ملعونين أما بعد for the happiness of Hazrat Zahra Marziya for the enlightenment of the graves of your Mahumeen and of the graves of the Shuhada Ulama and Siddiqeen for the safety of the Zahirin and the Azadar of Sayyid al-Shuhada around the world for the safety and the hastening of the reappearance of Hazrat Fahiyatillah al-A'adham arawahun al-Fida please recite Allah all praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Nabi Rahman, and Nabi Rahim. The one that has given us this opportunity to sit in the remembrance of Abba Abdullah for one more time. Truly, if we understood the importance and the greatness of these gatherings, we would never want to leave them. You heard before you that Hadith Kisa was recited, and there within Hadith Kisa it says, Wherever the zikr is done, وَحَفَّتْ بِهُمُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ The Malaika encircled the people. وَاسْتَغْفَرَتْ إِلَىٰ أَنْ يَتَفَرَّقُوا And they do istighfar for them until they leave that place. So if we understand the greatness of these gatherings, that not, not a single one of us should stand from this gathering, then not a single one of them will get up from that gathering, except that all his hajat, all his du'as are accepted. At every point within these gatherings, our du'as, our hajat, our wishes, our desires should be at the forefront. Because no one knows when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may accept it. Even at the time there is a hadith from the sixth Imam in regards to the Musibah of Abu Aba Abdullah. They say that Abu Abdullah descends to each of the Majalis when his Musibah is recited. He looks at each Azadar in the eye and he gives him permission to cry, then the tears fall. Then the tears fall, and the alim that was narrating this, he said, then if your imam is sitting in front of you, then what is there to stop you from asking your hajat from your imam? This is the greatness of these gatherings. It's an honor that I've been given this opportunity to come and speak to you, brothers and sisters, here all the way in Dublin, who would have thought in Southern Ireland. There are Shias as well. However, we live to learn. And inshallah, I can go back and also say that it's not just, you know, people, because you know, the first people to shock me were when I saw Asians and Arabs and Iranians speaking with Scottish accents. And I was like, <laughs> and now I've turned up in Ireland and everyone speaks like Paddy. <laughs> mashallah. So for one of the myths, which was actually true, and I'll let you in on this, in Scotland they do actually serve iron brew as niyaz as well. <laughs> but inshallah, the uh, drink of the Irish is not serving. <laughs> it is truly an honor to be here, and inshallah you bear with me. Um, I've been 
fighting a cold and at the same time reciting over the last, I think, eight nights on the trot. Uh, and this is, I'm now at the end of my <laughs> rest, so inshallah, the last bit of energy is for you. And inshallah, I pray that my throat holds out with a loud salat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. <laughs> Thirteen hundred and seventy-three years later, we sit here mourning Abu Abdullah. Thirteen hundred and seventy-three years later, we watch on the TV nineteen million, eighteen million, whichever figure you take, fill the vicinity of Karbala, a city that at its peak can only take three million. So how is it that twenty million are now circling around the Zareef of Abu Abdullah? 1373 years later, every single major city within the world has one question, who is Hussein? There are people handing out bottles of water asking people who is Hussein. There are billboards, there are bus stands. There are newspaper articles asking one question and that is who is Hussein? In order to awaken the people to ask the question that who is this Hussein? But we're asking the rest of the world. We're asking everyone in every major city. We're asking people in the streets. We're handing them bottles of water. But 1373 years later, when we're telling everyone else and we're asking them, who is Hussein? I can I ask myself, after 27 years of listening to the Majalis of Abba Abdullah, am I able to answer that question myself as to who really is Imam Hussein? Have I understood what say the Shuhada stood for? Forty days of mourning have passed us. And I need to assess what change has been brought within my life over these forty days. Because Karbala is a school. A school that had lessons. A school that had a book. It had teachers. <coughs> I need to ask myself, have I understood the message of Sayyid al-Shuhada? From the first of Muharram until the day of Arba'in, can I say that on the first of Muharram I was like this, but after hearing the message of Sayyid al-Shuhada, this Muharram, I have changed my life positively like this. Can I definitively say if I can, then I'm one step closer to answering the question, who is Hussein? But if my life and my understanding has been the same for 27 years, then I've done a great injustice to the Imam. If all I gained in 40 days was a bruised chest, some dry, sore eyes, a few late nights, then I have not done justice to Abu Abdullah. And why is it that me as a youth growing up here in the UK with access to every single thing, every article, book on the internet, I'm still unable to understand why Imam Hussein stood. And the reason is because we haven't actually stopped and looked at the core what was it that Sayyid al-Shuhada was trying to achieve? And what was it that drove him to achieve that? As the brothers before me were saying, and they highlighted a few of the points, that why is it that Imam Hussein stood? What is the reason? When we understand the reason, when we understand his aims, then we will understand how to inculcate those aims within our life and those driving factors, how I can nurture them within my life. So today, inshallah, in the time that I have, we'll look at these, the aims of Sayyidu Shuhada and those things that drove Sayyidu Shuhada. 
Because as Amir al-Mu'mineen says to Harith Hamadani within Nahj al he says in the letter to Harith, he says, Harith, you should know that history repeats itself. Look towards the kingdoms of the past and you will see that they are playing out in front of you at this moment. So if we look at the history of Sayyid al-Shawla, what drove his companions, what drove him, and what were the characteristics of the army of Yazid? We may have half a chance of being able to recognize the Imam about half. Recognition of the Imam is the aim. And through the recognition of the Imam, the person attains closeness to Allah. So what were the aims of Sayyid al The first of those aims was the protection of the deen from further harm. Protection of the deen from further harm. Because the deen, as was highlighted by the two speakers before me, had become corrupted. That someone like Yazid was in power. He had taken the reins of power. Now the wajibat were not considered. A person who, when the head of Allah Abdullah was brought to him, he said, he said in his famous poetry, there was no angel. There was no wahi, there was no revelation. This was all the game of Banu Hashim. This person was leading the Muslim Ummah. So Aba Abdullah, in order to protect the deen from further harm, he had to rise to stop it. And he writes to the people of Basra. We hear about the letter to Muslim Ibn Aqeel, uh, that he gives to Muslim Ibn Aqeel to Kufa. Whether we have read it or not, it's a different matter. Whether we get time, time. Ah, that's one of those hard things. I get that time to read. Uh, to be honest, some of the translations are pretty boring as well, right? So who's going to get that time to read and then go through these boring translations that have been translated so badly? So it's, it's effort, right? We've got time. He writes to the people of Basra. He says, you should know. Very short letters. The Imam writes very short letters. The one that he writes to the people of Basra, he says, You should know that the sunnah of my grandfather has been killed and innovation, bid'ah, is rife within society. That was the situation at that time. Now when I look at my life, when I look at my society, when I look at my community, I need to ask myself that how many bid'ah have been brought into my deen or how many sunnahs of the Holy Prophet have I killed? Rasulullah told me to do this. Okay, I don't need to grow a bit. It's okay. Rasulullah told me to do it, but I don't need to. Rasulullah recommended the extra prayers. No, I'll do the wajibat and get over and done with it. And then, that's just leaving it, but they're certainly actively working against us. This is the killing of the souls. How many innovations have we brought within our deen where certain cultural aspects become so important to us that when someone comes to attack those cultural aspects, we defend them as if they are the deen themselves. How many innovations have been brought within the Azadari of Sayyid al Within the commemoration of Karbala? How many of us are still of the opinion that Qasim got married in Karbala on the night of Ashura? How big a torment do we want to put on our Imam? That the Imam, knowing certain death for his nephew, is marrying him to his daughter. We have absolutely, when we study the Maqatib, we find absolutely no basis for any of this. There is no riwayah in any of the Maqatib except for one that was written 800 years ago and even then it was just said there was the Aqt. But every other one, Luhuf, Abi Mikhna, Fnafis and Mahmoom, all of our major Maqatib, so Qasim did not get married in Karbala. The Imam. Would the Imam do something like that? Sometimes we lower the station of the Imam by putting these 
aspects within the home. And then when someone attacks these, and we defend them like they are the dean themselves. And we're ready to die to defend the culture. How many innovations have I brought into my deen? Sayyidu Shuhada is saying at that time that innovations become life within society. Saying the Sunnah is dead. What was the greatest Sunnah that was killed at that time? The greatest Sunnah that was killed was the love of Ahl Bayt. That was the greatest Sunnah that Banu Umayya killed. They had actively tried to destroy this love of Ahl Bayt. Then I question my life. Have I killed the love of Ahl Bayt? Tawallah is one of our furu'a al-deen. Without tawallah, you know. And tabarra as well. Without tabarra, tawallah is incomplete. But tabarra is not just la'na on this person and la'na on that person. No, tabarra comes from the root of bara'a. In order to seek distance from that person. So when I'm doing tabarra upon a person and I'm saying may the curse of Allah or may Allah remove his mercy from Yazid ibn Muawiyah is not just saying it, but I look every immoral trait that Yazid possessed, I look at my life and see whether I possess them. If he was proud, do I have pride? If he was racist, am I a racist? If he was someone that did not give importance to the deen, do I give importance to the do I give no importance to the deen? When I have removed all of these aspects from my life, and then that is true bara'a, that I have totally sought distance from this individual, that every single trait that he possessed, I despise it so much that I've removed it from my personality, then I curse him. This is true bara'a. This is this true Tawallah. <coughs> and Tawallah, because Tawallah is, cannot be with, without Tawallah. And Tawallah cannot be without Tawallah. You can't love everyone. You have to hate those that hate the ones that you love. Tawallah, loving the Ahli Bayt. But it's not just saying, Ya Aba Abdullah Ruhi Lak Al Fida. Oh, Ya Aba Abdullah, my soul be sacrificed on you. Oh, Imam Hussein, I wish to be shaheed with you. No, Tawallah is every single thing that Imam Al Hussein wanted from me, I do. And every single thing he told me to stay away from, I stay away from. This is Tawallah and Tawallah. Sayyid al Shahada went out in order to protect us from the deen. And he gave the people of Basra the answer. He said, And if you obey my command, and you obey what I say or listen to what I say, I will take you towards success. Obedience to the Ahlul Bayt is what will stop us from further corrupting our day. Obedience and listening to the call of Ahlul Bayt. The second thing Sayyidu Shuhada set out to do was to seek reform. To reform that already broken thing back to its original state. And you've heard before, and this is the most famous letter, maybe one of the only letters of Sayyid al Shahada that we may know leaves it as a will to his brother Muhammad al Hanafiya. Inama Kharaj to the Talib al Islah, the Ummati Jeddi, Uridu and Amr bin Ma'roof and Ha and in Munka. That I'm going out in order to seek reform, reform within the Ummah of my grandfather by doing Amr bin Ma'roof and Nahi and in Munka. And the brother put it very eloquently in regards to what is Amr bin Ma'roof and Nahi and in Munka. There's a style, there's an adab to Amr bin Ma'roof. When we go to do Amr bin Ma'roof, it's with akhlaq. 
It's with manners. Not oh, hey, what are you doing? Her cup. He's coughing. Look what he's doing. I've seen this. This is our style of Amr al Ma'roof, right? When we send out a text, or we'll make a Facebook page, this person is this and this person is that. Send out a text to everyone from buy one of those cheap sims, yeah? so no one can track the number. And try and defame them. This is our, our way of Amr al Ma'roof, let's defame the person. But, no, Amr al Ma'roof and Nahi Ali Munkir requires akhlaq. But in fact, fact Sayyid al-Shahada gives, gives us a totally, totally different understanding in that very series. He says, أريد أن عمر بالمعروف وعنها أن المنكر وأصير بسيرة جدي وأبي علي بن طالب and I will walk upon the path of my grandfather and my grandfather, uh, my grandfather and my father Ali bin Talib. What is the Imam telling us? What do we understand from it? That Amr bin Ma'roof and Nahi Anil Munkar is through one's actions. The best way to do Amr bin Ma'roof and Nahi Anil Munkar is to become the perfect role model. So that when someone sees your actions are the best, your a'mal are the best, your akhlaq is the best, they themselves will change without you even having to say anything. This is Amr bin Ma'roof and Nahi Anil Munkar. Actions speak louder than words. That's what Sayyid al-Shahada. And there was another letter, incidentally, that Sayyid al-Shahada sends from Karmala, again to his brother Muhammad al Hanafiya. Very short letter, final letter that Imam Hussein alayhi salam sends from Karmala to his brother Muhammad al Hanafiya. He sends to his brother Muhammad al Hanafiya, he says, My brother, you should know. Hussein ibn Ali is at his last point and he's still sending his brother advice. He sh you know, you should know that the dunya will end and the akhirah will remain forever. This is the message of Karbala. And we'll come to it inshallah. The third thing Sayyid al-Shahada set out to achieve was to awaken society from its ignorance. This ignorance that the society believed Banu Umayya to be the only family of Rasulullah. The society that when they heard about the death of Amin al-Mu'mineen, they said, why was Ali in a masjid? That Ali, that when they asked him, Ya Ali, would you rather be in heaven or in the masjid? He said, I'd be in the masjid. Why? Because within heaven, ibadat is not wajib. But in the masjid, ibadat is wajib. And so I'd stay in the ibadat of my Lord. That Ali, when he was struck with a sword, he stands and watches the sunrise. And he says, oh son, bear witness. That Ali always saw you rise, but you never saw Ali sleep. That ignorance within the society that they had not understood the station of the Ahlul Bayt and they were trying to ignore it and this ignorance was rife within them you find it in say the Sajjad in Sham the person comes to him and says, it's great what I mean, uh, <coughs> Yazid has done to you. May Allah be pleased with this The Imam says, Ya Shaykh, Hal Qur'an? Have you read the Qur'an? He says, yes. He says, have you read the Ayah of Kathir? He says, yes, I have. He says, we are that Ahl al-Bayt. Have you read the Ayah of Homs? He says, I have. He says, yes, we are the Ahl al-Bayt. Have you read the Ayah of Mawadda? He says, yes. He says, we are that Ahl al-Bayt. Straight away there and then he converts. He comes then falls at the feet of the Imam, begins to fight them and they fight the army that are holding the Ahl al-Bayt captive. And they kill him. 
The Imam is there when he is in the court of Yazid, he's awakening them. وَأْتِينَ الْعِلْمُ وَالْعِلْمُ وَسَنَاهَ وَفَصَاهَ وَشُجَاعَ وَمُحَبِّ تَفِيقَ قُلُوبِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ that we have been given these characteristics, the characteristics of ilm, the characteristics of forbearance and clemency, the characteristic of eloquence within speech, the characteristics of bravery, the characteristics. And one of our characteristics is that, that our love is in the heart of the mu'mineen. The Imam is awakening him. That the people who said, you killed the family of the Prophet. This ignorance that I find when we look forward again and we come back to our life, do we have ignorance about aspects of Islam within our life that may form a barrier for my recognition of my Imam? My Lord, I have done volm upon myself. By committing sin, I have oppressed myself. And I have been audacious in my ignorance. I have been open in my ignorance. And sometimes we are, right? When we commit a sin, sometimes it doesn't feel like a sin to us. And then we go one level forward. Sometimes I commit a sin and then I'll post it on Facebook. Yeah? I hit the club with my mates at uni. So what I'll do, I'll take a picture, stick it on Facebook. Let everyone see. MashaAllah, share the sin. There's pictures, there's pictures that I shouldn't be looking at. Pictures of sisters on there or the girls without hijab. They like, they like, and they're looking good, darling. Yeah? The, the reality. I've got a music track. So instead of keeping that haram to myself, no, no, what I'm going to do, I'm going to post it on Facebook so all my 200 friends can listen to it as well. Spread the haram. I'm going to post it on my friend's wall and say, listen to this sick track. As the lovers of Amir al Mu'minin, one hadith in regards to music. Amir al Mu'minin says, من طرب قلبه على حرف من آلات الغناء The one whose heart shakes to the single note of a musical instrument becomes happy to the single note of a musical instrument and the crude singing the غناء is defined as not the turning of the voice but of the content of the music the music is the song is inherently haram is against Islam it is not anything that one can benefit from. The one whose heart becomes happy and shakes at the note of a musical instrument or that obscene singing voice. It is as if he has slapped me, Ali, in the face. And I've been audacious in my ignorance. I share my ignorance with the world instead of keeping it to myself and trying to prepare myself, trying to fix myself. I'll post it, social network it, Twitter it, Facebook it, so that everyone knows. The Imam was trying to awaken the people from their ignorance. The fourth thing that the Imam was trying to achieve was that political aim, not for leadership. The Imam didn't require leadership. The political aim as in the role of an Imam. Because the people had forgotten what an Imam was. This is why when the people of Kufa, one of the letters that comes from the people of Kufa to the Imam, says that we would like to appoint you as our Imam. It is from there you can tell that they were not, or a group of them that invited the Imam were not from amongst the followers of Ahlul Bayt. Because it is the, it is the aqeedah of the followers of Ahlul Bayt that the Imam is appointed by Allah, not by people. Not by the people. The Imam replies, Imam, You should know that the one that is an Imam is none. 
but illa al-amilu bil kitab is except the one that orders from the book of Allah follows the deen of haq establishes justice and he does every single thing ila zatillah for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala every single thing they'd forgotten even later on they tried to suppress it Harun is in the Hajj and uh, the seventh Imam is there as well and the people are surrounding the seventh Imam and they ask Harun, they say, who is this? He says, he is the Imam of the heart and I am the Imam of the mind. Yeah? They accept it. Yeah, it's, and it is often, uh, we often get sort of uh, sidetracked when we see a brother from the other sects praising our Imams. He's got to be under the Kamashiach. No, it is their aqeedah. They believe in the Imams to be the spiritual guides. When it comes to political guides, no, they don't accept the political. But we, as the followers of Ahlul Bayt, say the Imam is the one that is both the political and the spiritual guide. The Imam's aim was to awaken the people to the reality of the Imam, that the Imam is the total ruler over the Ummah. And the fifth aim of Sayyid al Shuhada was the one of Azadari. Was the one of Azadari. Was the one of his remembrance. Why? Because this is what kept. He knew that this is what will keep the message alive. The people see in the last Messiah of Sayyid al Shuhada. What does he say? Oh, my Shias, whenever you drink water. <coughs> Remember me, do my dhikr. And if you hear about someone who was killed while being alone, fendabuni, then do nudba over me. Why? Why? So that when you say that there is someone in Palestine that is alone and is being killed, but you're beating your chest and you're crying and saying, Ya Hussein, the people ask you, what? Who was this Hussein? That this person has been killed, but yet you are mourning Hussein. And then that gives you the avenue to bring about the message of Allah. They'll ask you, why are you shedding tears 1300 years later? What happened in Karbala? What was it that took place there that even now you sit there and you remember him? The final aim of Sayyidina Shahada was the Azadari of Sayyidina These tears that we shed. So, what led to the success of Sayyidina Shahada? What were those characteristics? We know the aims. Now, what are those characteristics? Very quickly, because I don't want to take too much of your time. What were the aims? What were the characteristics that Sayyidul Shuhada and his companions had? The first of those characteristics was that they put Allah and the Holy Prophet at the forefront of everything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was at the forefront of everything that they did within their lives. <laughs> Everything revolved around Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if it fitted within Islam, they did it. If it did not, they left it. He rides out. Final time after saying goodbye to all his women folk. After having lost all his companions, his brother. A son like Ali, As Ali Akbar, a nephew like Qasim, he mounts his horse, Ilahi, taraktul khalqa turran fi hawaak. Wa aytamtul ayala likay araak. Man katta'atini bil hubbi iraban. Lima lal fuadu al-siwaak. My Lord, I have left the whole of creation for your sake. I have orphaned my children so that I may see you. And even if they were to cut me in your love to pieces, my heart would turn to none but you. Allah was at the forefront. I often say that Karbala was the greatest love story ever told. 
the greatest love story ever told, the love of Abd al-Ma'bud. The love of the servant and the master. That he rides out reciting his poetry, he fights. The beloved replies, Ya ayyatuhan nafsul mutma'inna irja'i ila rabbi kirada atamadiyya. He falls from the horse to the ground, his head in sajda, ilahi ridam miradaq, wa tasliman li amri la ma'bud as-siraq, ya ghiyath al-mustabithin. My Lord, I am happy within which there is your happiness. There is none worthy of worship but you. Oh, the one that hears, the one that cries out. What is me, and I've submitted to your command. Can I say that Allah is at the forefront of my life like this? <coughs> Ali Akbar sees his father in this state, he says, Father. What is wrong? The Imam says that tomorrow this is what's going to happen. My father, are we not upon the truth? He says, we are, my son. And he says, let us be thankful to Allah. Can I be thankful to Allah in the face of the sorrows and the problems that I have within my life? Or is it that every time something goes bad, I say, why did Allah do this to me? Why is it that I haven't got this money? Why couldn't I land that job? Why didn't I get that grade that I wanted? I tried so hard. Why is it that Allah took away this person and that person from my life? Very often we are unable to see the greatness of Allah. Look at Abu Abdullah. Six month old child, Ali Askar on his hands. My Lord, this tragedy is easy for me to bear knowing that you are watching. Knowing that you are watching. Can I say that I have that sub? The greatness of Allah is at the forefront of my life. The second characteristic that they had was that in their eyes the dunya was something insignificant. This dunya that I chase constantly. The sixth Imam says that there are three types of people that shock me. The first, the one that is inattentive, he is unaware, but yet he is the subject of attention. He is unaware. But yet Allah is watching his every action. The second person, the Imam says, that shocks me. The one that is chasing the dunya and mouth and death is chasing him. He's unaware. And the third one that shocks me is the one that is happy and laughing. But yet he is unaware whether Allah is happy with him. Insignificance of the dunya. What is it for me? I gotta have my garbs. Yeah, I gotta get my garbs on. It's gotta be Armani. It's gotta be Prada. Yeah. I gotta make sure. I don't matter if it's fake. As long as it's a good fake. Yeah. We're fine. I gotta wear these clothes. I gotta get these clothes. I gotta have this car. If I don't get those alloys put on my car, man, I'll make sure I've got to get that. I've got to get that base box put in my boot. So everybody can know that I'm coming. Insignificance of the dunya. This is what Karbala teaches us. Karbala teaches us that there is a greater cause and sometimes we get tied up with the small things. And often what happens is we sell our dunya for our... Uh, we sell our akhirah for our dunya. The sixth Imam says those people that think that they will get to halal through the course of haram will never succeed. How? 
I say that I've got an intention, a niya, that I want to help this Husseiniya progress, I want to help it extend, I want to do all this in Husseiniya. So what I'm going to do to make some money quick is open an off license. Because there's good money. <coughs> Imam al-Sadiq says that person will never succeed. <laughs> He says that person will never succeed. The one that starts with haram and he hopes to get to halal. I want to get big within the media industry because I want to become a director, I want to become a producer. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to host a music show for a couple of years. Because I want to get my name. But you know, I want to get forward and then make documentaries for Muslims. will never succeed. When a person is more concerned with his dunya and tries to use the dunya to reach his akhara. That's not to say that uh, we go and live in caves and wear like rough clothing and you know, the brother Nabil came and he said you can't wear any sort of designer clothing and stuff like that. You can still live a life, but not a life of extravagance. A life where Allah is at the forefront, a life where Allah is first. Even though Amin al Mu'minin says, don't try and live like me, you won't be able to live like me. But, remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm more concerned about what mobile phone I'm going to get next. Yeah? Make sure I get this mobile phone, I've got to get this watch next. What are these things? The third thing that say the shuhada tried to achieve, or that, that, that characteristic that he had, was this concept of izza over zilla. The concept of honor over humiliation. That it was more concerning to him to become aziz. Imam says this illegitimate son of an illegitimate son presents us with two paths. The path of humiliation and the path of death. And we will never accept humiliation. How to become Aziz? I'll give you four very quick ways. I gave a whole hour's lecture the other day on this, but I'm giving you the essence of it. The first way to become Aziz, to gain Izza in the eyes of Allah and the people, there is a prophetic hadith that says, Control your tongue and you will become Aziz. You will gain Izza. You control your tongue, don't speak at every point, at everything. You've got to say something constantly. Control your tongue and you will become Aziz. The second thing is the ayah of the Holy Quran, the one that wants to become Aziz. فَلِلَّهِ الْعِزَّةِ They should know that all Izza comes from Allah, meaning the Ibadat of Allah. The Ibadat of Allah makes a person Aziz, makes a person gain respect. The closest point that I can be to Allah in my physical form is in sajda. The Holy Prophet says the one that prolongs in sajda will be with me in jannah. The companion of the sixth Imam says I sat next to the Imam, I saw him in sajda. I counted, he said 500 times, Subhana Rabbi al What do I do? Okay, we're done with it. <laughs> the other Muslims are Fajr, that's the fastest. <laughs> that's, that's the fastest. You know, you take that hadith and Mi'raj, literally. And the Prophet went and saw the heavens come back and the bed was still warm. You're trying to put it into action. Get out, get out quickly, pray to Mars quickly, get back. It's still warm. Yeah, it's still good. That is if I get out. Inshallah, when I get out. So do the ibadah to Allah. And you become Aziz. You gain respect, you gain that stature. 
The third way to become Aziz is those things that you do not know about. Do not take that task upon yourself to complete it or do not speak about it. I sit here and being a student, I'll say, you know what, this manager, I don't accept what this manager has said because you know, it doesn't make sense to me because of this, this, this. What's going to happen? becomes a leader in front of the eyes of the people. He said, so he's a barely a student of religion and the man of 40, 50 years and this fool is sitting here cursing the maraj. Saying we don't need taqeed. For example. Where we have this? Besides, or I, uh, I'm not a medical doctor and I sit here and start giving medical advice. What does this guy do? Stick to what you know. By taking or taking upon yourself a task that you are unable to complete, or by saying to speak about something that you know nothing about, makes you zalim in the eyes of the people. And the fourth way to become aziz is don't go to everyone and ask favors from them all the time. Do something yourself. All sorts of people always go to the yard. Could you help me out on this? Oh, you know, brother, hook me up, please. Hook me up on this, could you give me? For every single thing in their life, they have someone who they can turn to, except for Allah. Everyone, even when we do the ah, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Allah. Please sort this problem out in my life. You've got a week. If not, I know someone who's happy. The back of my Ya Allah, I've got this financial trouble. If it's not sorted in a week, I know someone who I'll turn to instead. Yeah, yeah. yeah the only time we turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when life is bad, Ya Allah. I did not revise for this exam, but I beg you, I need an A or my dad's gonna kill me. If I don't get into that uni, that's it. I promise I'll pray all the time. I'll do this. Please just, just hook me up with a 2 1. Just mean I'm not asking for first, just the two. It's our dua. We turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we need him. <laughs> the final way in order to become Aziz is not reveal your secrets to everyone. Do not tell everyone what you're thinking. Keep some things within yourself. Well, some people they have a habit. Gotta come out of it, I'm sorry. Sometimes we, the Holy Prophet of Islam goes to Mi'raj, he sees that uh, he's in the heavens and there's a small, tiny hole in the wall and a horn pokes out and then a, sort of another horn comes out and as this hole starts going and, this, and a huge cow emerges from this tiny little hole, a very scary looking cow and then it turns around and tries to go back inside the hole and it's impossible, just cannot go back. The Prophet says, Ibrahim, what is this? He says, ah, this is the example of the one that speaks the word without thinking. He speaks, all of a sudden it comes out. No matter how much he tries and takes it back, it will never be able to be taken back. Control of the tongue makes a person as he is. And that obviously if I'm swearing as well. The six of them are walking with one of his companions and this companion has a Jewish slave and the companion calls his slave the first time it's his slave he doesn't listen he calls him a second time he doesn't listen the third time this companion becomes angry he's with the Imam he becomes angry and he cries out to the Ibn Fa'ila Oh, the son of a woman of disrepute. Yeah? The Imam stops. He says, what did you just say? He said, this, I said, oh, woman of, oh, the son of a woman of disrepute. He says, to whom did you say it? He says, Imam, I said it to my Jewish slave. Imam, I said it to my Jewish slave. The Imam says, according to his faith and the faith of his parents, were they not married? He says, yes, they were. 
So why did you say this? Imam, I'm sorry, I, I got angry. Imam says, until the day that I am alive, never speak to me. Once where were they say this was the man that was seen with the Imam for so many years from morning until night this companion was with the Imam but all of a sudden one swear word from his mouth the Imam said get away from me don't speak to me and he died and left this world with the Imam being angry with him now you tell me when I in every single word every single sentence have to swear in order to make and get my point across do I still think that my Imam is going to be like my Shia where were you in this time We have to try and better ourselves. It's not just, just carrying on, got to be the big man at school or uni. This, this is the reality. Everything will end. Everything will end. Famali Alki. Alki le khuruj nafsi. Alki le dik lahdi. Alki le zulmat qabri. أبكي لسؤال ممكن ونكير إياي أبكي لخروج من قبري أريانا ذليلا هاملا ثكلي على الظهر أنظر مرتان عن يميني وأخرى عن شمالي إذ الخلائق شأن غير شأني إمام السجاد says in دعاء أبو حمد الثمالي he says for what reason should I not cry I cry for the time when they will take my soul from my body I cry for the darkness of my grave I cry for the narrowness of my grave I cry for the time when Munkin and Nakir will come and ask me those questions. I cry for the time when they will take me out from my grave and I will be naked and I will be humiliated and upon my back will be the burdens of my sins of this dunya. I will look to the left and I will look to the right. The whole of mankind will be worried about and themselves and no one will be worried about me. That is the reality. Those friends that I try and impress. When it comes to that day, no one's going to be there for me. Just me and my Ahmad. Control of the time. The fourth thing that say the Shahada the characteristics that say the Shahada that his companions had was that death was easy for them. Death was something they were not afraid of. Death was very, very easy for them. If it requires that my body be cut to pieces in order to save the deen of my grandfather, oh, swords, come and take me. On the night of Ashura, Basim is coming and asking his uncle that uncle will I too be amongst the shahada tomorrow, a 13 year old child. And Imam says, my son, how do you perceive death? He says, oh my uncle, I perceive it sweeter than honey. On the day of Ashura, they say Qasim came to his uncle and Imam al Hussein wouldn't give him permission, but the child would kiss the hands and the feet of Aba Abdullah, saying, my uncle, give me permission to go out and fight. Death was easy. The mothers on the night of Ashura are preparing their sons, make sure you go out and fight and die by the side of your Imam. Death, is death easy for us? No, no, no. when the Mayyid comes, no, 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 don't show the kids they get nightmares. Don't show the children they'll get nightmares. They'll get scared. It's a dead body. No, from a young age, if we tell them, we make them realize that death is inevitability. This is one of the realities of the dunya. Maybe then we can psychologically train them to actually work towards the earth. But death is a reality. Why be fearful of it? Why create the fear? For those in Karbala, death was easy. It didn't matter. And the fifth and the final thing that the Imam characteristic of the Imam and his companion had was the fulfillment of their duty. The Imam was fulfilling his duty as the Imam and they were fulfilling the duty as the Ashab of the Imam. That they were ready to give everything because the Imam had ordered. 
The Imam's order was there. When he comes with that safety letter of safety for Abu Fadl al Abbas, Abbas tears it up. He says, Why would I go with you when my master Hussein is here? Abbas is at the banks of Furat. He picks up the water in his hands. Ya nafs ba'da Hussein ahuni. He begins to speak with himself. My nafs after Hussein, oh myself. What pleasure is there in life after Hussein? You are drinking the syrup of water while your master is drinking the syrup of death. Abbas pulls the water back. This is the fulfillment of the duty towards the Imam. Have I fulfilled my duty to my Imam? I leave you with that question. That if my Imam was to see my day-to-day -day life, would I be proud that he was watching? Because the Imam watched every single aspect. In Mikyal al Makarim fi Fawa'i, the Dua al Qa'im, it says, there's a riwayah that says that the first Imam said that we know every time our Shi'as are ill, we are ill too. Every time they are upset, we are upset too. Every time they are happy, we are happy for them too. The Imam of our time cries twice a week when he sees the scroll of deeds of his Shi'as and he says, Is this the state of my Shi'as? And he weeps twice a week for their state. Have I fulfilled my duty to my Imam? Can I be like those in Karbala? Because those in Karbala give everything for the sake of Allah. Everything. Imagine this today is from the day of Arba'in. And on the day of Arba'in, they say it's mustahab, it's recommended to recite the musibah of the final moments of Aba Abdullah. He comes at the time of Asr. He comes outside the tents and he cries out, O oh, Sukaina, O oh, Rabaya, O oh, Zainab, O oh, Rabab, Alaykunna Minni Salah. Except the final salams of Hussein. They say they all came out of the tent and surrounded the horse of Abba Abdullah. They all came out of the tents and surrounded the horse of Abba Abdullah, each and every one of them weeping. Each and every one of them weeping, saying, let's don't go, whoever has gone has never returned. Abba Abdullah consoles each and every one of them, tells them to be patient, and then they all go back in. Abba Abdullah mounts his horse and he intends to ride, but the horse won't move. The horse won't move. But Abdullah looks towards the feet of the horse and finds his four-year-old daughter holding on to the leg of the horse, saying that, oh, horse, do not take my father, because whoever went never came back. But Abdullah comes down, he holds his daughter to his chest. He says that you must do sabr. If you find me lying upon the plains of Karbala with my neck severed and my head removed and the veins of my neck bleeding, then do sabr, my child for your trial is to come for your trial is to come he then gives the child to Hazrat Zainab he says Zainab take this one she was very dear to me take care of her he mounts his horse and begins to ride out they say all of a sudden he hears someone running and stumbling behind him crying out Mahalal Mahala Ibn Zahra slowly slowly all the son of Zahra he turns around he sees Zainab allow Zainab to look at you one last time Abu Abdullah goes out to fight. Abu Abdullah goes out to fight. He fights with such strength that they say that the horses that were at the back began to hit the walls of Kufa. But how much can a man who is thirsty from three days, hungry from three days, fight at one point? Imam al Hussein takes rest upon his horse. One man takes aim, he throws a stone that strikes the head of Abu Abdullah. The blood pours upon the face of Imam al Hussein. He takes me, he takes his shirt to wipe his face. Hormala saying, I saw the white patch upon the chest of Hussein. I took a three-headed arrow that I had dosed with him poison. And I fired it into the chest of Imam and Hussein. They say the arrow hit with such force that the head of the arrow came out from the back of Abba Abdullah. Imam and Hussein holds the arrow from the back. He pulls it out. He says, Bismillah wa billah wa ala millati rasulillah. He takes the blood within his hands, he puts it over his face. He says, I will meet Rasulullah on the day of Qayyamah. 
like this and say this person and this person killed me. Hussein begins to sway upon his horse. Some say that it was an arrow that struck Hussein and he fell from the running horse. Some say that Abba Abdullah's horse was running and a man struck him upon the head with an iron bar. But either way, as our Imam says in Zalatun Nahiya, that my salams be upon my Imam that fell from the running horse to the ground. But Hussein didn't fall upon the ground. His body was covered in so many arrows that Hussein was between the earth and the sky. And there he lay upon the plains of Karbala for many a time and that no one would come near him. No one would come near him. The horse comes forward. He rubs his face in the blood of Allah Abdullah and runs back towards the tent. But the women hearing the neighing of the horse come running out. Someone grabs hold of the horse and says, where have you left Hussein? Another says, where have you left my brother? Another says, where have you left my father? And one child comes forward. She says, oh horse, tell me this much. That's when they killed my father. Did they give him a drop of water? Did they quench his thirst? Zainab seeing this runs to Tille Zainabiya. She comes upon Tille Zainabiya. What did she see? A shibru jalis on ala sadrin. Shibru is upon the chest of Allah Abdullah. In his hand is a dagger. Holding on to the beard of Imam Hussein. He's beginning to cut the neck of Imam Hussein. She stands there crying, Wa Muhammad, Wa Aliyah. Is there no one amongst you that is a Muslim? She runs back to the tents to awaken Imam Sajjad. She runs back to the tents to awaken Imam Sajjad. She says, Sajjad, your father is being killed. At this point, there is a, a, a sound heard. Allah qad qutil al Husaynu bi Karbala. Allah qad zubi al Husaynu bi Karbala. Hussein has been killed in Karbala. Hussein has been slaughtered in Karbala. Imam Sajjad says, oh, Auntie, move back the curtain of the tent. Zainab moves it back. Sajjad from his bed point says, Assalamu alaykum ya Abba Abdullah. The head of Abba Abdullah is upon the spear. Zainab again runs out into the battlefield. She comes to the body of her brother, the headless body of her brother. She begins to recite Amadhiya. She says, Bi Abil Mahmoum hatta qada. Bi Abil Atshan hatta qada. Bi Abi Man Shaybatahu taqtaru bin Dima. Let all oh, may my father be sacrificed upon the one that was killed when sorrows were within his heart. Oh, may my father be sacrificed upon the one who was killed while he was thirsty. Oh, may my father be sacrificed upon the one whose body and beard is covered in blood. <laughs> Thank you.